Uh, I would like next uh, to welcome uh, Yon Kuche, who will talk about weak monotone comparative statics. Okay, thank you for uh, organizing this wonderful conference. Um, thank, you for, thank you for having me to present this paper. And thank you, the participants, for listening in. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Jinu Kim at Seoul National University and Fuito Kojima uh, from Stanford, who I believe is uh, here with us uh, and is going to answer questions. Um, so one, I, I guess, caveat is that the uh, paper itself and the presentation also naturally uh, is pretty dense with a lot of terminologies and concepts and uh, some background which I won't have time to talk about. So uh, there is a bit of a handout um, that I prepared and that I think available uh, through a link at the, at the program. So you might, uh, if necessary, you might consult them. Okay. So the project, um, what we are doing basically, we are studying the monotone comparative statics uh, in the style of uh, Topkis and Milgram Shannon and other people by asking uh, under what conditions uh, can we say that the uh, predictions of some interest increase as the environment changes in a, in a certain, certain way. Um, so in using this method, one important element is the uh, set order, the notion of what it means for one set to be bigger than another set, uh, let's say based on the primitive order, which is often well defined in the, in the problem. And the, most of the existing studies, uh, including Milgram Shannon and Tapkis, focus on strong set order. So what, what is that? So let's say the problem that you are dealing with is given with a partial order set, uh, partial, partial order set X with some very defined order. That can induce a different kinds of set order. The strong set order means the following. So we say, uh, a subset x double prime is bigger than subset x, uh, x prime. Uh, if uh, we take an element from uh, small x prime, small would be smaller set x prime, and another element is x double prime from a bigger set x double prime, and if you form a join of the two, so pairwise supremum of the two, then must belong to the bigger set x double prime and uh, pairwise meet x prime uh, meet x double prime should belong to uh, the smaller set, right? So if it's, I'm sure many people have seen this uh, under, and understand what it means, but if you see it, you haven't seen it often, uh, uh, it's very difficult to parse what this actually boils down to. Uh, substantively, uh, this implies the set order we are going to be focusing on, uh, this weak set order, uh, and that's sort of implied by strong set order, it's a weaker. And in the following sense, sense uh, we say x double prime is bigger than x prime in the weak set order. If uh, for any element in small set x prime, you can find an element bigger than that, weakly greater than that, in the bigger set x double prime, and that's what we call uh, upper weak set order. And uh, likewise, if you uh, have an element uh, x double prime, let's say, from a bigger set x double prime, uh, you can find an element that is weakly smaller than that in x prime. And that's what we call a uh, low weak set order, okay? So together, uh, that gives us weak set order, okay? So strong set order implies weak set order and also gives up sort of a substance of what we care about uh, economically but of course not the other way around. Uh, the, use, the strong set order has been working pretty well when you analyze the monotone competitive statics of individual choice. Namely that if you sort of think about utility maximization, um, the set of maximizers uh, can be set to increase uh, as a function of a parameter under some nice set of conditions, let's call them Milgram-Shannon conditions because they provide the canonical conditions. And that consists of the utility function satisfying single crossing property in choice X and parameter T, which basically means there's some sort of complementarity between the two in the sense that 
if it pays to increase x uh, from let's say x prime to x double prime at low value of t, it continues to pay to increase the action from x prime to x double prime uh, at a high value of t. Okay, so that's the sort of the order. Uh, in the, the, the incentive to increase action is preserved as you raise the parameter. Together with the uh, uh, quasi supermodularity, uh, what, which means that you know, the uh, payoff must be, uh, there must be some complementarities across different uh, components of your action. So if you raise one component of action, action that increases the incentive to raise different components of action. So these two conditions together are sufficient for the set of maximizers to increase in the sense of strong set order as a function of t. Uh, and also, it's sort of nice thing about it is also, it's sort of necessary in the maximal domain, domain sense. So it's very tight sufficient condition. So it works pretty well with individual choices in the sense that these conditions seem pretty sensible and essential and kind of necessary. But if you go beyond individual choices, uh, the, it turns out that the uh, uh, you know, uh, strong set order turns out to be not so appropriate because it turns out to be too demanding uh, to, for us to expect to hold generally. Especially in the multi-agent setting, when you think about the equilibrium of uh, Nash equilibrium of games, stable matchings, uh, and whatnot. Uh, so this is a sort of a classical example of that. So let's say that the payoff function of each player satisfies the Milgram Shannon conditions. Let's say with respect to the opponent's strategy as a parameter, which means in this case the uh, strategy is one-dimensional, one so it boils down to single crossing property, and that simply will imply the best response correspondence is non-decreasing non in the strong set of the sense. I draw a special case where it's actually a function, it's unique. And, uh, and through for both players, let's say, then you have this set of equilibria that we have. And let's further assume that the, uh, the payoffs uh, exhibit single crossing property with respect to some parameter. So there is a shift of preferences or whatever you environment that shifts the uh, best response correspondence or function of player one out. Right, shift up or shift out, and you get a new set of equilibria like that. Okay, and we can say that uh, the large uh, equilibrium and smallest equilibrium, which are well defined in this context, increases both, which means that, uh, which implies uh, uh, the set of equilibria uh, shifts off, increases in the in the sense of weak set order. So if you to for any equilibrium in, uh, before, there is a higher equilibrium after. For any equilibrium after, there is a lower, smaller equilibrium before. Okay, but it doesn't satisfy uh, monotone competitive statics in the sense of strong set order. So, take an element of an uh, old equilibrium, let's say x. Uh, take another equilibrium x prime in the new equilibrium. Okay, if you take the join of the two, that's x that belongs to old equilibrium, but doesn't uh, is not a new equilibrium. So it fails to satisfy uh, monotonicity in the, in the strong set order, okay? And there is nothing you can do about this kind of problems, okay? So I, people have thought about it, and I mean, this kind of comes with the, the property, uh, the, the territory, and um, uh, unless you are prepared to make sure that the equilibrium is unique either before or after, uh, this kind of issue, you cannot really improve, improve the sense in which that the equilibrium set uh, varies monotonically better than, better than this, okay? So given that this is all you can get, our approach is then, you know, why not simply take the weak set order as a, as a main notion and think about what are the conditions that we can uh, impose to guarantee monotone competitive statics in the weak set order, presumably I guess the most of the, most of the dividend will be obtained in the multi-agent context where uh, uh, weak set order is more appropriate notion and more feasible notion than strong set order. Uh, hopefully that will come through more clearly why it is also more appropriate uh, beyond, beyond the game context. But given that weak, uh, and we call them weak monotone competitive statics, uh, compared with the strong monotone competitive statics, by which I will mean 
monotone competitive statics in the, in the strong set order. Okay, so since the, the uh, requirement is weaker, uh, the conditions that will give us this sense of this kind of monotone competitive statics will be, will be easier to satisfy. And what we do, our agenda is basically to uh, look for conditions that will give us weak monotone competitive statics of various predictions uh, in the context of individual choices, uh, Pareto optimal choices, Nash equilibrium of games of certain class, and two-sided matching. And in the process, we will also contribute to uh, uh, the existence of fixed points and stable matching and their comparative statics. And one kind of new kind of uh, application that this approach will open up is that we're going to be able to accommodate an individual in the context of, let's say, game, in the context of, a, um, in the context of a, a matching, whose the, the agent whose preferences are incomplete. So we can accommodate incomplete uh, preferences. Okay, so I was going to begin with individual choices. Um, and so what we do there is to provide a couple of characterizations along the lines of Milgram Shannon and Quine Strulovich with conditions that are weaker and uh, intuitive. Unfortunately, given the time constraint, it's probably better to, to omit, uh, skip this and focus on uh, applications that are kind of more relevant for us, more suitable for our, our innovation. So let me begin with the Pareto optimal choices, okay? So it's a very standard setup. So I'm not going to talk anything much about the technical details. So the choice set that we will consider is to think of it as the subset of Euclidean, Euclidean uh, space. So we have a finite set of individuals uh, who make a sort of social choice and the set of social choices X uh, is, uh, is endowed with uh, a, a well-defined partial order. And there are well-defined utility functions on, on this set of choices. And we will deal with the profile of payoff functions or utility functions UI. And P of U is the set of Pareto optimal choices on the profile of utility functions UIs. And so one way to think about uh, the Pareto optimal choices uh, is not, I mean, it's useful to think of it just not as a social choice concept or efficiency concept. It's also useful to think about uh, uh, Pareto optimal choice as a model of describing a behavior of agents whose preferences are incomplete because often the behavior of such agents can be described by a multiple set of, uh, you know, well-defined linear order. So, so think about a parent dealing with multiple children or think about headquarters of organizations dealing with multi-division multi organizations and each organization or so each children have well-defined linear preferences, which may or may not agree all the time. And uh, as a headquarter, as a parent, uh, what you want to do is to to do whatever uh, they want to do, right? Uh, if their preferences agree, or if not, then you you want to do something that is undominated, and that basically leads to Pareto optimal choice. And this sort of way of thinking about uh, the choice of in the, you know incomplete uh, preference agent is kind of very natural and has been adopted in the literature. And simply put, what we want to do is to, is to think about, imagine a shift of preference profile from U to V and ask sort of what kind of conditions that does this shift must satisfy for us to be able to say that the set of product optimal choices increases in the, in the sense of weak set order. Okay, so this is the question. This is simply sort of weak monotone competitive statics exercise about product optimal choices. And Surprisingly, to our, you know, to our surprise that to the best of our knowledge, so nobody sort of asked these questions, which I think is a very natural question, and, but nobody uh, sort of asked these questions. Um, I guess that in the get-go, when you think about these questions, that the first thing that might come to your mind is that, you know, what if, you know, what if the preference shift uh, for at the individual level is such that that satisfies sort of Milgram and Shannon conditions? So in other words, that uh, you know, could it be that if the preferences change uh, from U to UV, that kind of makes individuals at the individual level want to raise their action, let's say in the sense of satisfying Milgram-Shannon conditions like single crossing domination 
or you know uh, quasi commercialality or not would it be enough for the Pareto optimal choices if everybody wants higher actions than lower action it seems natural to expect that the Pareto optimal choices reflect their preferences and so that it will increase also right it turns out that this is not generally the case. Uh, for this to be the case, we need actually additional, additional conditions. Okay, so here's an example. So initially you have a pair of utility functions, U1 and U2, okay? And you can easily, con uh, and then one thing that is kind of uh, peculiar is that the set is non-compact, okay? So underlying set is uh, zero one interval, but it's not compact, okay? Now anything to the right of one half is part of dominated by something smaller. Okay, it's not Pareto optimal. Anything to the left of one half um, uh, is also Pareto dominated by something slightly below. Okay, the only uh, Pareto optimal choice here is one half. Okay, which is Pareto dominated, obviously. Okay, so it's, that's the starting point. Let's imagine imagine that the preferences uh, for this individual shifts up uh, to something like this. By the way, before the, you know, these guys' uh, preferences are all decreasing. These guys, you know, uh, decreasing in each segment, uh, increasing uh, across segments. So here, uh, you know, had the, you don't need to satisfy. I mean, the, it's very easy to satisfy single crossing property uh, when you create new new pair of uh, uh, utility functions. So V two trivially satisfy single crossing property, a single crossing domination of U. V1, the only care you have to satisfy, uh, you have to uh, exercise is that every point here dominates every point there, which you can see is, is uh, satisfied as well. Okay, so what's Pareto optimal choice here? Any choice here uh, is Pareto dominated by something slightly to the right, okay? Anything here uh, is Pareto dominated by one quarter. Okay, so the unique Pareto optimal choice is one quarter, which is strictly below one half. Okay, so individual, at the individual level, preferences have shifted in such a way that they want to raise the action, but the Pareto optimal choice actually does fall, which kind of suggests that you need some other conditions further. Okay, so here the natural candidate is the, you know, this is non-contactness, okay which will often also be a problem if you want to guarantee the existence of Pareto optimal choices as well. So it turns out that we can actually restore our initial uh, conjecture, that is that you know, the conditions that are often very tightly sufficient for individuals to want to raise their, their actions, that's sufficient to give us the, uh, the monotonicity in the weak set or the sense of Pareto optimal choices. Uh, on the in a sort of well-behaved uh, environment, by well-behaved, I mean simply that the uh, x is compact uh, and each utility functions are upper semi-continuous, and these are the conditions that you need anyway to guarantee the existence of uh, Pareto optimal choices. With that, uh, we also get this, this result. Uh, for sanity check, if you actually compactify, <laughs> if you sort of make it compact like that, in fact we can show that we get the uh, weak monoton competitive statics of the Pareto optimal choices, but not in the strong set order, only in the weak set order sense, okay? Because the join of a quarter and, and one half is actually one half, which is not part of the new Pareto optimal choice. Okay, so as proof is so simple, I can actually go through the proof a little bit, okay? So for the proof, uh, uh, I think it's sufficient to show that the smallest Pareto optimal choice and the largest Pareto optimal choice kind of increases, okay? Uh, so I work with the inf. So take the inf of the Pareto optimal, smallest Pareto optimal choice under u, okay? And think about any choice be below that, okay? So obviously that's Pareto dominated, okay? Because it's uh, smaller than the smallest Pareto optimal choice under u. Uh, the question is, would it be Pareto dominated by something that is Pareto optimal, okay? In fact, that's not quite trivial, okay? It can be satisfied only on the compactness assumption. So here is where we need the compactness, okay? Given the compactness, however, so X is Pareto dominated by X prime, which is in turn Pareto optimal, which means that X prime must be strictly greater than X, 
okay? So X prime pareto dominates X. Now, since V, single crossing dominates uh, U, okay, the incentives are preserved, which means that X is continued to be pareto dominated by X prime. Doesn't matter whether X prime, but it's pareto kind of dominated on the, on the V, which implies that the uh, infimum of V must be equally greater than uh, infimum of uh, U, okay? Likewise, you can sort of order the supremums as well using analogous arguments. You need to do a little bit of care, but that's the main idea. Okay. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention that this is true only when X is totally ordered. X is one dimensional, results are pretty clean. Uh, the conditions that you need for typically need for individual level, individual choice, in, for individual, for monotone comparative statics. Uh, strong monotone comparative statics, statics of individual choices will be sufficient for weak monotone comparative statics of Pareto optimal choices. What about uh, the general case? Uh, unfortunately, uh, in the general case, uh, you need more conditions. Okay, um, uh, so uh, so so there are a lot of conditions here. So I think that it's 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 hard to process them. So, but I can break down these conditions for you. Uh, basically, the red conditions are the cardinal versions of the Milgram Shannon conditions. So those are stronger than the ordinary conditions that are often sufficient for uh, monotone comparative statics of individual choices in the strong set of the sense. Uh, we need the cardinal conditions for the argument that, that we use. The blue conditions are the conditions that are uh, like, you know, X is convex, compact, and U, V are semi-continuous and, and concave. Those conditions are necessary to, uh, or sufficient to guarantee existence of product optimal choices. But more importantly, uh, they are needed to uh, guarantee that the utility possibility set uh, in, the, in terms of U vectors, utility vectors, is closed and con convex, okay? And the significance of that is that uh, we can characterize, we can try to characterize the set of Pareto optimal choices with a convex, closed convex utility possibility set with a sort of weighted utilitarian welfare maximization. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, uh, there is a very long standing difficulty with characterizing Pareto optimal choices even in that con in the setting with the weighted utilitarian welfare optimization. So, and we, turn, and we use some sort of, a, we came up with a new characterization uh, that sort of a sequential, that sequentially maximizes, maximizes which, you know, weighted utilitarian welfare functions. I think I'm not, I'm running out of time. I have a lot of things to cover. So let me just move on. Uh, so yeah, at the high level, the approach we take is that we sort of turn that uh, product optimal choice Characterization. I mean, we use the characterization um, uh, of uh, Pareto optimal choices via some optimization problem, and we use uh, the well, you know, established machinery of the, uh, uh, you know, the monotone comparative statics of, for maximizers developed by Milgram and Shannon, but in a clever way. So in a repeated and inductive way. Uh, to prove that the, uh, so these are the conditions that are going to be sufficient for monotone competitive aesthetics of the, um, the Pareto optimal choices. One thing that I want to, I'm not, I'm, I won't have time to go over this, but typically the set of Pareto optimal choices would look like this. So it will fail to be a lattice, which is kind of significant, okay? That sort of a significant challenge when it comes to, let's say, embed, uh, you know, the behavior of agent uh, with incomplete preferences in, in the game setting, which, which we are going to do. Uh, so let me turn my attention to fixed point theorem and applications. So what's the starting point here? Uh, it's a tarski linjo uh, fixed point theorem, which turns out to be very useful when it comes to characterizing and, you know, ex establishing existence of Nash equilibria in sort of Supermodular games, and also most more importantly for our purpose, purpose uh, performing uh, monotone competitive statics. Okay, so that's the starting point. 
the conditions required for, for existence and monotone competitive statics, however, is very, very strong. So you need to have uh, X to be form of complete ladders, it has to have this boxy shape. And more importantly, this self-correspondence, the fixed point operator F, which is correspondence, is required to be a complete sub lattice value, meaning that for each x, f of x is in turn must be a complete sub lattice. So it must have this boxy shape, which is kind of very strong. So the new theorem that we developed, which has to be in, in part largely credited to a mathematician named Lee, whose proof we, we have discovered after we did our own. So we have our own additional contribution. So, so we list our name as well as there, his name. Uh, we, we, we conduct conditions in the following way. We don't require X to be a complete lattice. We just require it to be partially ordered set, okay? We don't require F of F, the operator to be complete sub lattice value. We just require it to be compact values. We also require X to be compact value, uh, compact. So, sort of once, what's kind of uh, notable here is that we are combining the older theoretic uh, notions, conditions with the, the topological conditions. So you might ask what kind of topology, it's in the, in the handout, so I'm not going to talk about it. The regularity condition simply means there must exist a point um, uh, X such that, you know, F of X contains a value greater than X, meaning that there must be a point above a diagonal, okay? Um, so, the, which is very mild. Uh, in general, in the Euclidean space, our condition is uh, much weaker than these conditions required by Tusk and Lin, uh, Linjo theorem. The fact that we are relaxing the lattice uh, structure is a significant weakening. Moreover, the sense of monotonicity is also different. So, uh, in the Tusky Joe theorem, F is required to be strong set monotonic. So, the X must be increasing in the sense of strong set order. We require F to be increasing only in the weak set order. Okay. Now, we are assuming less. So, we must not be getting as much as they, they are. And in fact, that's the case, okay? One side product of the Tarski Joe is that not only do you get existence of fixed point, theory, fixed point set, uh, fixed point, but you also get uh, that the uh, set is a complete lattice. Okay, we don't have that, but rather we have uh, existence of maximal point in the case of upper weak set monotonicity being assumed, uh, and minimal point in the case of uh, lower weak set monotonicity. So if you, have, you have, if you are just assuming weak set monotonicity, then you get both maximal and minimal points. Okay, now this is completely new. Uh, so furthermore, what nice thing about this our fixed point theorem is that it admits, uh, it, permi it permits the uh, uh, monotone competitive statics in the weak set uh, order sense. So in particular, if there are two operators, F and G, both are correspondences, uh, satisfying the conditions that we laid out before. And if J, G, uh, upper weak set dominates F at every value X, then the set of fixed points uh, under G, upper weak set dominate the set of fixed points under, under F, and analogous result is obtained for lower weak set monotonicity. Then one nice pro side product of the Tarski type fixed point theorem is that uh, under the additional assumption of order continuity, which is simply the continuity or along a monotone sequence, monotone conversion sequence, uh, it actually, the operator itself acts as a constructive algorithm. So if you, know, if you sort of follow iteratively, if you apply the operator iteratively, you, 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 you arrive at a fixed point uh, there. And we preserve that property as well. So as long as you start from a regular point, either above the diagonal or below the diagonal, uh, and then we iterate the, this operator, uh, then we will we'll arrive at a um, arrive at a fixed point. Okay. So the most significant uh, example of that is the Gale Shapley, of course, which is nothing other than uh, this monotonic uh, iteration of the operator. Uh, in the in the strip down uh, situation of matching matching uh, games, okay. So now with that uh, fixed point theorem and the weak monotone, monotone competitive statics uh, developed, it's very easy then for us to uh, generalize the class of games uh, um, 
that known as the supermodular games were games with strategic complementarities uh, by weakening the conditions that are required for us to be able to get this kind of uh, nice result in terms of existence in terms of in terms of the um, uh, permitting uh, monotone competitive statics with monotone competitive uh, statics um, so you know as long as we assume you know make impose conditions that will give us uh, this uh, the uh, weak monotone competitive statics at the level of individual choices, we can get the results. So let me not say much more than that, except that uh, we get both existence and, uh, and, and, and the weak monotone comparative statics of Nash equilibria in the class of, uh, in the class of uh, weak strategic complementarities. And I guess that there are several applications we can talk about, but in the interest of time, let me just mention that one application that is kind of new is that we can accommodate uh, a player whose preference is incomplete so that this behavior is characterized by Pareto optimal choices uh, uh, among sort of several linear preferences, um, based on several lin linear preferences. And so instead of thinking about it, so we can simply define best response as a Pareto optimal response for such individuals. And typically, the uh, such Pareto optimal choice uh, fails to be a lattice, okay? And so that the traditional theorem will not uh, apply to such a setting, okay? Because every, um, uh, the, the, you know, best response uh, correspondence must be complete subletters values. Okay, so, so any situation like this cannot be applied, but we can because we are not requiring that. All we require is this uh, correspondence to be compact, compact value, and, and that's much more easily uh, satisfied. Okay, so that's the main thing. Uh, we didn't, I have, don't have much time left, so let me take another maybe seven minutes, eight minutes to talk briefly about uh, on your, the general. On the previous slide, the condition was on the best reply sets. Can you give sufficient? Yes, can yes. You give we can give sufficient conditions at the level of the individual payoffs. Uh -huh, um, yes. Or at the yes. level of the, of the preferences, uh, which would exactly. imply condition on best reply. Exactly. We, we, I think that the, we developed this uh, characterizations of the monotone competitive statics for individual choices, which unfortunately I had to skip. And, and the conditions that we, we impose there can be used to guarantee that the best response will, will exhibit the kind of conditions that we need for our theorem, fixed point did theorems you, to, to apply. Did you, did you skip it because it is too complicated to write down or? Uh, I skipped it uh, for obvious reason that we all see that I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, so the uh, so this is a uh, we generalized uh, model of two-sided matching with contracts. So we have the typical setting we have is a, a finite set of workers, finite set of firms, and the unit of analysis is the uh, finite set of contract. And each contract specifies a worker and a firm who are involved for a contract and a contract term. Okay, and then we can. Then we can then describe individual's preferences based on choice correspondence for each agent. Uh, and uh, we can also define allocation to be feasible. So this is a many to one matching. So one feasibility requirement will be that at every feasible allocation, uh, which is just a set of contracts, uh, each worker can, uh, be, can sign only one contract, right? So that will be the detail that need to be specified. But we can define also, uh, we can then define a stable allocation in, in the appropriate way. I'm not going to talk about it, but it involves individual rationality and no blocking. So there is nothing new here, so let me skip that. And what are the conditions that we, we impose? Typically to guarantee existence of stable matching, we need to assume some sort of substitutability of the preferences. And here, I think it's the weakest possible conditions that uh, we can imagine and we develop in an environment where the preference uh, may exhibit indifferences or may even exhibit incompleteness of preferences, right? Uh, so the, the way we sort of talk about it is that the, 
you can define based on the choice correspondence, the rejection correspondence. So these are the contracts that you that are remaining after you 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 choose some contract. Uh, I mean, so the, these are the contracts that you don't you don't accept, right? You don't choose uh, from the set of contracts that are available to you. And typically, uh, substitutability uh, means that this rejection the rejection function is. Uh, by the way, this is a, um, the order is a set inclusion. Uh, so rejection uh, correspondence, uh, rejection function is non-decreasing. So meaning that as the, the choice set expands, uh, you reject more and more, you become more selective, okay? Um, and here, uh, the weak sort of condition that we impose is that the rejection correspondence must be weak set monotonic in the sense of set inclusion. So the more set you get, uh, so you, you reject more in the sense of set inclusion. You typically need another set of conditions, uh, typically the weak axiom of reveal preference, uh, which is needed for characterizing uh, the set of stable allocations through uh, some sort of fixed point of some, some operator, which is typically what we do. This is kind of the state of the art. Here, uh, in the correspondence context, the warp consists of two conditions, sense alpha and sense beta. Sense alpha says that if the choice set shrinks, okay, and whatever was optimal before, before shrinking, if still remains available, must be still chosen, must be optimal, okay? So this is very compelling assumption that we, we do keep, but sense beta, which kind of says something completely different. So if the uh, choice set expands, and if one choice that was optimal uh, remains optimal, the another choice that was used to be optimal when the set was uh, small, must be, is, if it's still available, must be still chosen, okay? So it basically says that, you know, the multiplicity of choice correspondence must be attributed to indifferences. But in the world of incomplete preferences, one can, easily imagine that when the, when the new choice becomes available, it may dominate uh, one uh, optimal choice before, uh, but without dominating another one, okay? So you can imagine that in the world of incomplete preferences, sense beta can easily break, broke, uh, violate it. And so what we do is that we just uh, uh, assume weak substitutability and sense alpha. Uh, and then uh, we sort of follow the standard sort of methodology of building a tatongman like operator, which basically maps a set of contracts available to a set of new set of contracts after letting agents uh, exercise their choices. And this, by iterating these choices, uh, you get a stable matching when you find the fixed point, and this is a characterization result. So in the interest of time, let me not talk much about it, except to say that uh, this, is a, uh, this is a generalization of the result in the sense that we uh, relax this work. We just assume sense alpha and, and that's it, right? Um, and, then, uh, and then we get the existence by weak substitutability and sense alpha, which is necessary for characterization and the weak substitutability, which makes in, uh, ensures that the correspondence that we build exhibits a uh, weak set order monotonicity uh, according to a particular order that we build. And then uh, it's a matter of, apply, a matter of applying our fixed point theorem to conclude that the, the, the uh, fixed point exists an ergo uh, stable matching, stable allocation images, okay? Uh, the other sort of wonderful thing about the fixed point theorem is so amenable to the monotone competitive statics. So we can easily uh, establish uh, weak monotone competitive statics of the set of uh, stable allocations. So if the preferences of the agent change in a particular way, we can then say the stable allocation also change in a, in a particular way. In particular, if there are some agents, uh, a choice becomes more permissive in the sense of set inclusion. So that, you know, they, they accept more, they kind of, uh, the choice, correspondent, uh, choice correspondence increases in the set inclusion sense. Then you can say that um, then the agents on the other side 
uh, uh, meaning that if the choice correspondence become more permissive for a firm, then the workers all become better off and all other firms become worse off. And this just follows from basically applying the monotone comparative statics, uh, part of the fixed point uh, theorem that we have, you know. Uh, and I th that the primary applications of our ability to incorporate agents with incomplete preferences is that, I mean, this, you know, example is um, the incomplete preferences, not just academic, it's of, of, not just of academic interest, because if you're dealing with the multi-divisional organizations, uh, this is very natural. And also if you're dealing with um, uh, uh, matching with the regional caps, okay, we can then, um, we can then sort of think about focus on the entire region as a one entity. And then we can work with uh, the, the, the region's choice correspondence and, and get, obtain uh, stable allocations with respect to the region's uh, correspondence. Um, and then, of course, one, one side product is that we can get the monotone comparative statics in the weak set order sense very easily out of the uh, fixed point theorem. And let me just conclude, uh, since we are running out of time very rapidly and, and uh, nothing more actually, we, we are still uh, uh, on the lookout for more applications for these fixed point theorems, for other, other cases, other results that we, we develop. Um, but in summary, what we do is to focus on this new weaker monotone comparative statics uh, notion and then uh, develop conditions that give us that uh, under different contexts, individual choice, paradoxical choice, Nash equilibria, and stable matchings uh, in many to one, uh, two sided matching context. And that's it. Okay, for a couple of minutes or questions. Yeah, I, you, I might have missed uh, something you said earlier, but if you look at two-sided matching, a la Gail Shapley. Uh, are, from your more general results, can you say something about that case for more, uh, you know, uh, maybe incomplete preferences, something, some insight for that model through your work? So all of the results there are carried over to our setting because our model strictly nests yes. that model. In fact, yes. you can sort of generalize one-to-one -one matching developed by Gail Sharpley to allow for many to one matching with yeah. strict preferences, which is what they used to assume. We can then relax strict preferences to allow for indifferences. Uh -huh. We can then uh, relax the uh, indifferences to allow for incomplete preferences. And that's what we are doing. And we can also incorporate, incorporate contracts. And that's also what we do as well. And so in the strict down version of uh, Gail Sharpley with strict preferences, our operator basically uh, reduces to Gale Sharpley's algorithm. Right. And since everything is finite, you can simply iterate that operator from the largest to arrive at one extreme stable matching. And also you can iterate the algorithm from the lowest to arrive at the other extreme uh, stable matching. Right. Okay. Okay. Unfortunately, we lose the lattice even with a very simple form of indifferences. So we are not going to get those extreme stable allocation just because of that um, in our context. But we do have a maximal, we do have a minimal uh, point, which are, which are very easy. Uh, we also constructively use that as an algorithm, as a, as a, as a method of finding uh, and, uh, matching as well uh, in our context. Okay. Uh, I look at your paper, but uh, so you allow incomplete preferences over there. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Yonko. Uh, okay. Thanks.